the Commodore VIC-20. Welcome to the age of the computer. As you grow with Vic, Vic grows with you. The Vic. The Vic accessories. Commodore Vic 20. The one to grow on. It's been a while, Hal. Yep, this is my third video covering all things Hal, and usually Kirby would be the main subject matter. I've tackled their pinball games and even their golf games with their short-lived Hole-in-One series. Please check them out after this video. But for now, I want to tackle a subject I don't see many cover. Hal, of course, had a past, and their past is a little... misty. In fact, their history is something that was quite hard to find more details of. As some of you know, and I mean those who watch my previous Hal videos, the company didn't start out developing for Nintendo, but for many home computers, Computers like the MSX, MSX2, and most particularly, the Commodore series of computers like the VIC-20 and the Commodore 64, pretty much working with Commodore to make games for those systems. But what kind of games did they make? Well, other than the pinball and golf games I've already covered, they've made some original titles to say the least. You've got the likes of Money Wars, an arcade-style game you must bring a bag of money from one corner to the next, and the lightning projectiles drop faster as you continue your money carrying. you got poker, which is simply poker. Can't go wrong with that. Slot machine as a slot machine, simple as that. There's Bordomado Pants, where you catch eggs and toss them into a pipe. There's a ton more games they developed, but that's not what I'm discussing today. I'm talking about their clone games their rip-offs, their copycats. This was at a time when game developers would copy the most popular arcade titles on the market, whether they got the license to release these clones or not. And usually the Yakuza would be involved too, but that's a possibly dangerous kettle of fish. In short, it was the wild west of sloppy copyright in video games. And no other game was copied legally and illegally more than Taito's classic and seminal shoot 'em up, Space Invaders. Nihon Bazan did it, SNK did it, Midway did it with another version of the game, and Hal has done it as I'll explain in a bit. If I can't think of another company, that did it, that means they're no longer with us. It was a get-rich-quick scheme and for some, it worked. Many went to arcades to play any kind of Space Invaders, to the point where there were arcades dedicated solely to said very game. That's how big it was. The supply and demand was there for the taking. Until the likes of Pac-Man and Xevious came out and made Space Invaders and the obsolete at the time, as far as I'm aware. So to simply put, I'm taking a look at HAL's games that are clones of other classic games. You might be shocked to hear that a beloved company like HAL once plagiarised classic titles, but please watch this all to the end, because there might be more to this than you may assume. But anyway, let's begin. I have a list of these clones ready to talk about that I got from Wikipedia. In fact, that very list was the inspiration for this video. So with that, I'll go in sort of a random order because most of them were released in 1981 anyway. And I mean sort of because there's a few I want to save for last. Oh, and the Commodore VIC-20 was known as VIC-1001 in Japan. So keep that in mind. Though I'll just refer to the machine as the VIC-20 as it rolls off the tongue better. In addition to me showing off more of the VIC-20 versions than the C64 versions, as how were more involved in the former versions. No, it's not a game adaptation of the only good movie in the franchise, but a game released in 1981. This game is a clone of 1979's Hyankyo Alien, a maze title not made by a game company, but a group of students of the theoretical science group at the University of Tokyo. It's seen many commercial and even arcade releases, and I say releases because despite getting an official arcade release by the short-lived Denki Yonkyo, HAL wasn't the only company to make their own clone, whether licensed or not. Heck, even Taito, whose Golden Goose at the time got copied to more times than I can count, copied Heiankyo Alien. Hopefully they got a license to make said clone, otherwise that's kinda sad. I mean, come on man. Those students needed that money for pot noodles. Oh wait, this is Japan. Ramen. From comparing the two versions, the graphics look the same, but the colours and sound effects are different. This is a method many other companies would do back then. Maybe it's to possibly avoid any lawsuits unless a few companies felt rather risky one day. The gameplay is very similar, there's similar enough games with oftentimes unpredictable AI, so it's not too hard to copy. It's not known if HAL got the rights to make this game, but like Taito, I bloody well hope they did. Oh, and whilst I'm here, the Game Boy version of this game fucking sucks. It's downright awful. Don't play this one. Ah, 
here we go. Just from looking at this one, you know what this is a clone of. But you know what? From looking at the gameplay and for a VIC-20 game, it doesn't look that bad. In fact, it looks good. Gameplay-wise, it's not half bad. I'm surprised Hal copied the music beat whenever the aliens take their sidesteps. You could mistake it for a legit port. That's how impressive it is. I'm not sure whether Hal got the rights to this one. I put my money on maybe, since it was released in other countries, particularly in Europe. Who knows? All I know is, we got ourselves a good port but a clone all the same. The game also got a port in the Commodore 64. It looks the same and I'm assuming it also plays the same. Any issues? I just hate those sound effects and now I have a headache. Jupiter Lander is another VIC-20 title that also got a release on the C64, and is somewhat of a clone of Atari's 1979 classic Lunar Lander. But from what I learned, Lunar Lander is in fact a genre of games loosely based on the landing of the Apollo Lunar Module on the moon in 1969. Most games consist of controlling a spacecraft as it falls toward the moon or someplace else. You use thrusters to slow down the descent and try and move around horizontally to plant said spacecraft very carefully. It crashes and is destroyed when you hit either obstacles or hitting the ground too hard with too much downward force. There have been many versions of Lunar Lander, from Tranquility Base to IBM's Rocket Lander, there's Lander for Windows 3.1x developed by George Monomisato, and much more. So you might assume that Jupiter Lander is technically a genre and not a copycat of Lunar Lander. Well, Jupiter Lander has a similar gameplay structure to Lunar Lander, even to where the level zooms in, so you can accurately land slowly. Plus, this is technically a clone of a clone of an original game nobody can play anymore. The gameplay is similar, but due to the limitations of the system, the level design is somewhat simplified. It's not going to be a very satisfying port. Kind of a shame after HAL made a near fateful version of Space Invaders on the same system. In terms of music, we do get some jingles with one at the beginning being ripped from Nichibushi's Moon Cresta. So they took music from the same company that made Space Invader clones. Bloody hell, there was no mercy back then. Road Race is a driving game for the Commodore VIC-20 and 64. This is a clone of Atari's innovative and obscurely influential Night Driver from 1976. The original game has you driving along a road at night time. The goal is to avoid crashing into the sides unless you want a bout of epileptic seizures. The arcade original had a steering wheel and a four selection gear shift to get that immersive feel for the game. The challenge comes from roads getting narrower and more curvy as you play the game. It's also known for the car design being a plastic insert on the screen instead of a sprite due to hardware limitations. This is something used in a few known arcade titles. Anyone remember Space Invaders Part 2's rainbow plastic insert? The game is a very influential title that has been left in obscurity with it being the earliest first person racing games. Though Dr. Reiner first, Nürburgring 1 was the first. But it was Atari's Night Driver that became far popular for the time. I'm learning so much about this game. Howl's Road Race compared to the arcade original is not a bad feat. Five years of technological advancements and we finally got that car sprite put into the game, while still looking near faithful to the arcade original. Though the speed has unfortunately took a hit, but from what I've seen, it plays decently for the system. But is it better than the Atari 2600 port? In the end, it doesn't really matter. The arcade original is so primitive looking that both versions look better by default, but the Atari 2600 port, whilst looking kind of tacky with its colour and graphics, has the speed and smoothness that the VIC-20 port doesn't have. And as for the Commodore 64 port, graphic-wise is an improvement over the VIC-20 port, and its speed does come close to even the 2600 port, but still falling behind a bit. Either way, a nice set of ports that have their strengths and weaknesses. HAL's attempt isn't that bad, but I'm more impressed with the 2600 port for keeping that speed and movement near Fateful. Night Driver, a game where its ports impress me more than the arcade original. How quaint. So it seems I half assed my work on the Pinball video. You see, in that video, I covered Pinball Spectacular on the Commodore 64, a video pinball slash breakout hybrid game that's less pinball and more pong because that was still relevant back in the day. I exclaimed that the game was designed that way due to the limitations of the system. 
That is incorrect to an extent. What I failed to find out was that this design was copied, but to get a better understanding of this mess, and to make sure I don't screw up like this again, here's Pinball for the Commodore VIC-20 released in 1982, and here's Namco's QDQ from 1979, the second sequel to BG from 1978. Already you can see a similar level design, with the VIC-20 clone being more colourful, but it's far more squished than the arcade original, which had a table-like screen, common in many arcade games for the time. The gameplay is nearly the same as QTQ, even the ghosts are here and accounted for. The blocks don't have the characters drawn on them, possibly due to the limitations of the system. You've got the faces in which you can turn their frown upside down as well. Other than the extra text being omitted, it's similar to QTQ. Now on to Pimble Spectacular for the C64. I know I already covered this, but again, this is to set things right if you catch my drift. It seems that the C64 version is a reworked version of the VIC-20 game and how reworked it to be less of a clone of QTQ. Though it would end up being very similar to BG sequel, Bombi. You know, looking back, I'm actually kind of glad I ended up half assing my coverage of this game a few years back. Now in terms of legality, well from this moment onwards, and possibly including this game, here's when things are set straight. Radar Rat Race is a clone of Rally X, but here's the weird part. A port of Rally X exists on the VIC-20. You see HAL, albeit Commodore, got the rights from Namco to develop and release some arcade ports to the Commodore VIC-20 onwards, though this deal was exclusive to Japan and Japan alone. Bally Midway from US of A got the rights to release the arcade original and possibly the home console slash computer ports, though Rally X was only ported to the MSX, Sharp X1 and Fujitsu FM7, in which no Western publisher had any involvement with save for the MSX port which was published by Bugbyte in Europe. It was mostly Japanese ports and most stayed there. But in terms of the VIC-20 port or even the Commodore 64 in the West, HAL ended up changing sprites and the title of the game to avoid any legal issues. So the game is Rally X but replaces the cars with rats, the stationary boulders with black cats and the flags with cheese. Basically you try and collect cheese whilst avoiding the other rats. You got the star screen to stop the rats chasing behind you for a short period of time, replacing the smoke screen from the arcade original. As such with these arcade games, the more levels you beat the harder it gets, with more rats chasing you with higher speeds. The graphics are basic for the system but it was an early title for the computer so it's understandable but it was released for the short lived Commodore Max machine and a Commodore 64. I feel later ports could have improved upon, well, everything. This is kind of a disappointment. One thing to note is the music, as it's an altered version of Free Blind Mice, and a part of it repeats endlessly to where I feel it gets really annoying. It's an overall fine port of Rally X for the system, but quite difficult even on the first stage to the point of being bullshit. In terms of challenge, it has a lack of balance. Rally X starts relatively easy but gets harder in the process. I may not be too fond of it, but a lot of people who are fans or grew up with the VIC-20 love this game, which is interesting. There's fans of an obscure system. Not like that's a problem, mind you. Star Battle is another VIC-20 game from 1981 and a clone of Namco's Galaxian from 1979 and… well it's a port of Galaxian. You pilot a ship, there are rows of aliens in front of you, with some kamikaze in at you because of Japan's repressed memories. And you gotta shoot them all down and do it all over again until you lose all your lives. And this port is the best it can be given that I've had plenty of years of experience with the original game. In short, it plays well and shooting can… Well, it could be better, as the enemy hitboxes are much smaller than those of the arcade original, so you need to get a more direct hit at the aliens. But other than that, it's an alright port of Galaxian, but one I wouldn't come back to play again when the arcade original is easily playable elsewhere. Plus, the Famicom port is much better. Now, this game is a bit special because it was entirely written by the legend himself, Satoru Iwata, who credited himself in the text shown, though hidden as an easter egg, but with a patch can be restored. Bally Midway also got publishing rights to Galaxian at the time, but unlike Radar Rat Race who got away with its release in the west, Bally Midway seemingly caught wind of Star Battle and restricted its sales thereafter. Though that's not the end of these kind of controversies when I get to the final game I'll cover. I'm guessing to avoid any more fury for Midway, Commodore made a deal with them to port some of their games to their computers. These included Seawolf, Gorf and Wizard of War. 
Now this is the one I saved for last and for good reason as it has a very interesting history surrounding it. Jelly Monsters is Pac-Man. Anyone can tell you that in a heartbeat. The graphics are similar, there isn't no rude word spoken, it's just some good old Pac-Man. And whilst the ghosts have some weird AI that makes the game much harder, though that's probably due to the squash maze compared to the arcade original, it's at least a competent port of Pac-Man. It's alright. And now for its history. Like all the Namco games shown in this video, HAL had the home computer rights to Pac-Man, and so developed the Commodore VIC-20 port, which would be released in 1981. Commodore themselves decided to release it in the West, though all they did was change the name from Pac-Man to Jelly Monsters. Though this is where Atari enters the fray as they got the rights to release ports of Pac-Man in the US at the time. In fact, Jelly Monsters was released a year before the planned 2600 port that Atari was banking on. And I'm guessing in a sudden case of paranoia and sheer greed, wanted to wipe out any competition who may have made Pac-Man clones via lawsuits, including the game Hal made. A well-known lawsuit involved Atari Sue and Phillips over Casey Munchkin, another Pac-Man clone. To summarize, it failed for Atari first time round, but eventually won an appeal the second time round, and Phillips had to remove the games off the shelves. Going back to Hal and Commodore, they too were targeted and were taken to court with Atari winning the lawsuit, resulting in Commodore recalling all copies of Jelly Monsters. Now I did find a little tidbit that Atari specifically sued the UK division of Commodore rather than the US division, meaning that it might have been a strategic choice to sue that division. Who knows? But the VIC-20 players won at a complete loss, as Atari ended up releasing their own version of Pac-Man on the system in 1983. So was it any good? Look! 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 What the fuck is this? Fuck me in the Alps, this is crap. That's the second version of Pac-Man where the supposed clone was better and more faithful than the official release with Amsterdam's MSX port of Pac-Man being better than the official, and now this. But if it makes you feel any better, Atari rushed the 2600 port to market in order to make more money around the holidays, and the result is a shit port that didn't sell well in addition to making too many copies even for the time, whilst HAL's port was more faithful and had some bloody effort put into it. And now HAL is part of Nintendo making infamous series like Eggerland, Kirby, Mother, and created the first Super Smash Bros. game which has gone on to become Nintendo's most iconic series of party fighters. Whilst Atari is a shed of its former self being owned by the French and releasing a half-baked console that only Atari fans are going to fawn over. Now that's a fitting punishment. After the lawsuit and possibly in a horrid mood, HAL sold the Japanese home computer rights to Denpa, porting the game to many home computers in Japan like the FM7, PC88, the Sharp MC computers and the Sharp X1, with the PC6001 port being developed by Microsoft, the PC98 port being developed by Wiz, and of course Namco themselves developing the MSX port. I told you Jedi Monsters was an interesting topic, but not as interesting as this box art. What the bloody hell is this? What the fuck is this? But in such a mad lad move, I don't think I've ever seen before in the gaming industry, despite being sued by Atari and having Jelly Monsters being removed from their shelves, Commodore, without the assistance of HAL, went and made a Pac-Man clone of their own called Cosmic Cruncher and released it in 1982 for Canadian players. I'm not kidding, that is one massive fuck off to a bigger company I've ever seen. It's literally Pac-Man, but the ghosts were replaced with aliens, the fruit were replaced with planets, the power pellets were replaced with spaceships, and in yet another power move, they replaced Pac-Man with the Commodore logo. The 80s was one hell of a wild ride, wasn't it? Godspeed, you absolute lunatics. I gotta respect that. That's a company with no more fucks to give. They wanted to release their own Pac-Man clone and they didn't care if they were going to get sued a second time. And strangely enough, they didn't. Probably because Atari by that point were busy trying to fix their reputation over their crappy version of Pac-Man for the 2600. It's a huge mess that we can look back on in sheer frustration, knowing that the modern gaming industry just keeps going downhill, and this history piece was a warning. So that's it for HAL's clone games. For the most part, HAL have been largely innocent when it comes to legalities, with their Namco clones mostly being legal when taking games like Star Battle and Radar Rat Race into account. But I'm not sure about the others, especially Atari's games given the result of the demise of Jelly Monsters. If anything, you can blame Commodore for releasing these games in the West even at the risk of lawsuits that eventually came to them. But again, they are the epitome of mad lads. At the end of the day, it's an interesting look into video games of the past that not many people think of. HAL wasn't the only company to make clones of dubious legality, but you're probably surprised that they did them in the first place. Nobody ever talks of HAL of the past. They think of HAL who made that pink soft cannibal who likes to eat everything, and that's okay. 
In fact, you'd be surprised they were ever able to survive in this industry at all, but with hard work and enthusiastic programmers within that small little company in Akihabara, anything was possible. Though, all that took to gain success was nearly going bankrupt after a poorly sold Famicom game with a little too much ambition thrown into it, leading to Nintendo saving said company, and of course, the rest is history. But that's for another time. Until then, this video has come to an end, and if you like it, then do what you choose, I'm Froben, and this has been a very interesting topic regarding the company who made Kirby. See you next video.